Before we begin, please join me as we open with a word of prayer. Gracious and almighty God in heaven, you who are the creator, thank you for your word and the instructions that you give us of the things that you require from us as your people and for the things that are to come upon the earth. We thank you that you've given us a complete picture of your plan of salvation right from the fall of Adam and Eve, right up until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when he shall return to the earth. We pray that we will have a clear vision of these things so that our faith in you and our determination to serve you will be full. We pray that you will help us tonight and our speakers that they may provide clarity to us and that your scriptures might come alive as we take this time and read together. Please hear our prayer for we ask it in the name of your son, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as you note there, uh, these talks are being presented by the Christadelphians in Canada and the US on the West Coast anyhow. And uh, we would like to uh, remind you that it's good if you have um, printed copies of the of the uh, booklet. Um, if you are unable to print them and you'd like a copy, you can ask us for a copy and we'll try and get one printed and sent out to you. Uh, our reading for tonight is from Genesis chapter 3, and it's telling us that a little bit after creation, the man and woman were then being tested to see if they would follow God or not. Many of the basic Bible principles are found in the early chapters of Genesis, and without biblical understanding of what is contained in this chapter, much of the remaining Bible message will not really make a whole lot of sense. So it's important that we consider it in, in context of our subject. So during creation, the Garden of Eden was created, and we, the Garden in Eden, and this third chapter is really detailing the events that take place in this unique place of the creation of God. So let's read together from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, 
Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden, to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. These are the topics that we are going to be covering this evening, since many of the concepts that we're talking about are only found in the Bible. And the uh, terminology for this session is very important. The two paths will demonstrate that people make choices for and against the commandments of God. And the tips are in reading are self-explanatory. We're now going to consider some of the words used in the Bible. Our first presenter tonight is Skip, who is uh, going to take over from here. Skip. Thank you very much, Bill. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be able to spend this time with you with God's by uh, word open before us in the Bible. So in our terminology this section this evening, we've got a, a, a lot of terms that we would like to have a look at. Um, I need to finish this particular section at about 7.30 because Jonathan has a long section. Jonathan is going to be go going over that reading that we had this evening in, in Genesis chapter 3. But as you have a look through this list, you'll see there's a number of these items that are act actually came up in Genesis chapter 3 and we'll We'll spend a bit of time on them, um, and as a result, we probably won't get through the whole list by 7.30. So uh, we've, we've got the serpent, and you'll see that what, what we're showing here is the, the uh, Hebrew word, nakash, which means, uh, or comes from a root word, which means to hiss or whisper. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the serpent and some ideas that come along with that. Along with that, we look at the uh, okay. we look at the Son of God, we are Theos, Son of God, Son of Man, uh, cunning, or as the King James had uh, in in chapter three and verse one, uh, the serpent was subtle. Uh, Eden, the Garden of Eden, uh, seed, uh, the word Hebrew, the Hebrew nation, Hebrew people. Um, Israel, also talking about that nation of people, but also talking about the man, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And then Judah, or sorry, Jew, uh, descendant of Judah, and the idea of altar. Like I say, I don't think we'll get through all of this list. Uh, well, I do want to spend some time particularly on serpent and how that relates to this idea of the son of man and the son of God and the, the serpent being cunning. And this will actually introduce some of the things that uh, Jonathan is going to talk about when he gets into chapter three. So when we look at the word serpent in our Bibles, and keep in mind that when we're looking at these particular words, and I'm going to go back one slide. When we're looking at these particular words, these are the English words used in our Bibles. And depending on what translation you're actually using, you may have a different word. So, for example, this fourth one, the word cunning, um, in the King James Version that Bill read from in verse 1, it talks about the serpent being subtle. The New King James says cunning. So, you may not see these particular words uh, always in your version, uh, but that's the idea that we're looking at. And it's the, the Hebrew word or the, Jew, uh, the um, Greek word for the New Testament, which actually helps us to get to know what these are about. So what's the Hebrew word for serpent? And you've got two of them. Uh, one is nachash, 
coming from a root word, which means to hiss or whisper. And so this idea of nakash is a snake from its hiss. And you, you, you can almost hear that in that nakash. You can hear the, uh, the snake uh, going through the grass. The other word we have is sarah. And again, that, that sound kind of fit in with the hiss of the snake. But the nakash is the hiss or whisper part of it. The sarah is actually a burning or poisonous. And if you think of uh, in our area here in the Okanagan, the North Okanagan, we do have uh, some rattlesnakes. Um, uh, and I, I, where, where my parents uh, built a home on Okanagan Lake when I was 11 years old, there was a rattlesnake den just about 100 yards up the hill across the road. So we got to respect uh, to learn how to deal with the rattlesnakes. I've never been bitten, but I understand that if you are bitten by a rattlesnake, it is a burning feeling. You get a burning uh, at the site of the bite of the bite. And so that word seraph or burning is, is uh, significant uh, from the point of view of it's talking about the idea of a poisonous snake and also used as, uh, symbolically. So let's have a look at these, these particular verses. First of all, I, uh, Genesis chapter three and verse one uh, that Bill just read for us. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So this is the serpent. And like I said, Jonathan's gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, it is a deceitful, uh, didn't tell the truth. Uh, but it didn't realize it wasn't telling the truth. So there wasn't a, an evil intent on the serpent here in Genesis chapter three. Uh, just have a look over at the Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 25. Now Isaiah, uh, the middle of your Bible is usually with Psalms. And then after Psalms, we've got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and then one of the, one of the major prophets, Isaiah. At the end of Isaiah, almost end of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 25, notice what it says. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 25. <clears throat> this is talking about what the kingdom of God is going to be like. Uh, so verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. So there's a time when wolves and lambs will work together instead of one eating the other. The lion shall eat straw like a bullock. There's a huge change for the diet of the lion. And dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, saith the Lord, saith Yahweh, as we saw that word was. It's all capital letters. It's Yahweh, as we saw last week. So there's serpent. There's that nachash idea. Go back in Isaiah to chapter 30 and verse 6, and you'll see the, uh, the idea of a serpent um, being a, a poisonous serpent uh, uh, or a burning, uh, sorry, the idea of burning here in this particular verse. So Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 6. <clears throat> The burden of the beasts of the south under the land of, the, of trouble and anguish from whence come the young and old lion, the viper and fiery flying serpent. That fiery flying serpent, the fiery, uh, the serpent is a different word, pardon me, the, the word flying is a different word in the Hebrew, but the fiery serpent comes from that word sarah. Let's have a look in the New Testament as well. Um, and again, I'm going to come back to this word, uh, the, these two words in, in a minute. But in the New Testament, we've got a, a Greek word, office, uh, from, the sharp, from the idea of the sharpness of vision, the idea of being sly because it's, uh, it, it, it's bright, it sees well. And so there's an idea of sly that comes along with that or cunning, remember cunning is 
uh, one of those ideas we're going to look at in a few minutes. Luke chapter 11 and verse 11 talks about that. It uses that word. Um, let's have a look at Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. So Matthew, the uh, first book of the New Testament, and I'm going to get a Bible marker and stick it back in my in Genesis chapter 3, because we'll be going back there, and, uh, and it'll be easier to get there. Matthew, first book of the New Testament, chapter 10 and verse 16. Now, this particular verse is not in your manual. Uh, I think you might find it helpful just to add it to your manual. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus is sending out his disciples to do work and teach. And he says in verse 16 of Matthew 10, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So you can see that th this idea of sharpness of vision or sly and cunning, it can be even, even that sounds not very good. Uh, cunning, well, that could be good or bad, but wise as serpents, this idea, the, 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 the word for serpent can be used in a good sense. It's not that serpents are always bad. I mean, no, most people don't like serpents. Most people don't like snakes, um, but they're not necessarily always bad. And uh, let me show you another passage. Uh, turn, turn in your Bible to Numbers chapter 21, verses 5 to 9. Now, Numbers is close to the beginning. We've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So it's the fourth book of the Old Testament, back in chapter 21. And we'll start reading at verse 5. And we start at verse 5 because this gives us enough context to know why uh, verses 6 to 9 happen. The people have been disobedient to God. Uh, verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses. So they're talking against God. They're they're, they're, they're rebelling against God. And they say, Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. So because they're complaining to God against God and against Moses, then God says, verse, verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. So I'm going to read the rest of this off of the screen. This word fiery is the word serah, and the word serpent is the word nakash. So here we've got the two words for serpent used together. Fiery serpents. The Lord sent serah nakash. He sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. This is God's punishment on them for their disobedience. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. So up in verse 6, the fiery serpent is two different words. Here in verse 8, it's just the word serah. It's translated by the King James translators as fiery serpent. But know what the Lord said. The Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. So make an image of one of these snakes and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. So Moses made a serpent of brass. Goes back to the word nakash. He makes a serpent of brass and put it brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So if someone had been bitten, and if they believed what Moses told them about looking at this serpent that we put on a pole, if they believed, then they were healed. I'd like to go over with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 
verses 14 and 15. Now, uh, um, Jonathan's going to take us to John chapter 3, uh, verses 16 to 19 or 16 to 21 later on this evening. Just look at what leads up to what Jonathan's going to be talking about. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the idea of John chapter 3 and verse 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, and so on. One of the probably the best known verse in the Bible. But look at the background, look at the lead up to that. Verses 14 and 15 in John chapter 3. Um, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So here's here's an echo, here's a Bible echo. Here's John, the, 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 the gospel writer. Uh, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. And he's saying, go back to Numbers chapter 21. Think about what happened with Moses in Numbers chapter 21. And now look at the application that Jesus puts on it here. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Son of Man talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. How and when was the Lord Jesus Christ lifted up? When he was crucified, when he was put on a stake, just like that serpent was put on a pole. And if people looked at the serpent and believed, they, got, they lived, they were healed. Verse 15 of John chapter uh, 3. Why does that talk about uh, so much the Son of Man be lifted up? So that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so if they believed in Jesus, if they believed in the work of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, then they would live. But it goes right back to the serpent in Numbers chapter 21, when the people were disobedient, God punished them. If they believed what God said to do, then they were healed. So this serpent is symbolical of something in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I want to do at this point is, is you know, many people in the churches round about us today, they think about the, the old serpent, the devil and Satan, called the devil and Satan. And they say that his name is Lucifer. They say that he's a fallen angel uh, from heaven. Um, those are ideas which are not actually in the Bible and all connected together. In fact, the idea of uh, Satan simply means an adversary, someone who's against someone else. If Phil and I go out and have a game of tennis, he's going to win because I don't play tennis. Uh, but if we go out and have a game of tennis, he is my adversary. I am his adversary. I'm the good guy. He's the bad guy. Well, from his perspective, I'm the bad guy. He's the good guy. It simply means an adversary. They can both be good, or they could both be bad. Simply an adversary. The devil, on the other hand, means a false accuser. The devil is a liar. He's always bad. And so the, 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 the Satan, have I been saying serpent all the time when I meant, meant Satan? Sorry. Satan is adversary. Uh, it could be good or bad. Uh, devil is a liar, always bad. So they're not the same thing. And the serpent is not the same thing as all of those. Now, because this all relates to John chapter 3, point forward to John chapter 3, and the Lord Jesus Christ on the pole, on the stake, then we come to this idea of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. The Greek word for son is huios. Anthropos, well, that sounds pretty familiar. That's the idea of a human being. So we as Anthropos is the son of a human being or a son of man. It's a title used of the Lord Jesus Christ because he was born of a woman, because he was born of Mary. Um, and if you go into Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, here we have the, uh, the first gospel in the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament. In chapter 12 and verse 40, it says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So 
he's crucified, he's put up on a pole, just like that serpent uh, was put on a pole. Uh, after he dies, then he, uh, he is put into the grave, he's put into a tomb for three days and three nights. Why did that happen? have to happen to Jesus? Why did he have to be crucified? It's because he was born of a woman, because he, de he inherited mortality from Adam and Eve, just like you and I inherit mortality from Adam and Eve. He inherited, even though he never sinned in his life, he inherited a natural tendency to sin, just like you and I do, because we are descendants of Adam and Eve. And that had to be destroyed. That had to be got rid of. And that's what the crucifixion did. John, Jonathan will tell us a little bit more about that uh, as we go through that this evening. In contrast to, to being son of man, Jesus was son of man because he was born of Mary, but he was also son of God because God was his father. So there's that Greek word quios again. Theos is the Greek word for God. So he's not only the son of man, he is also the son of God because he is the son of Mary and because he is the son of God himself. Um, our time is just about out on this. So have a look at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 35. So the third Gospel, the third book in the New Testament, chapter 1 and verse 35. <clears throat> and actually, for context, go back to verse 31, verse 30. The angel is appearing to Mary uh, when Jesus is about to be born. He tells Mary that she's going to have a son. Verse 31, you should call his name Jesus. Verse 32, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, because David is one of the great, 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 great grandfathers of Mary, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I don't have a husband. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit, the work of God, shall come on thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So Jesus was the son of man because he was born of Mary. He was mortal. He had the natural tendency to sin that all of us have. But he was also the son of God, which enabled him to overcome that natural tendency to sin and never, uh, and never actually sin. But because he was mortal, he had to die. So he's crucified. He dies. But because he never sinned, being the son of God, God raises him from the dead after three days and three nights. So that, that takes, us, takes us then to this word serpent. And this is the last one we're going to have a chance to look at. Go back to Genesis chapter 3 to our reading um, in verse uh, 15. Not serpent, but seed. Yeah, it's seed. That's right. I've got too many words with S and I'm mixing them up. Serpent, Satan, seed. They're not all the same thing. Sorry about that. So we're talking about seed back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And again, Jonathan's going to talk about this a little bit more. But look at Genesis 3 and verse 15. God said to the serpent, now verse, verse 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this and so on. Verse 15, I'm going to put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, Eve. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, Jonathan, again, is going to tell us more about this as we go along. He's going to talk about two different seeds. There's, there's a line of people, a disobedient group of people, a sinful group of people who are the seed of the serpent. They're descended from the serpent in the sense that they have the thinking of the serpent. On the other hand, there's the seed of the woman. The Lord Jesus Christ is particularly the seed of the woman, and anybody who thinks like the Lord Jesus Christ uh, would be referred to as the seed of, of um, the woman, of the, uh, yes, of the woman. So the Hebrew word for seed is zura. It means offspring. 
product of reproduction, both animal and vegetable, and that's the verse we just read. In the New Testament, the word for seed is sperma. And of course, this is quite familiar to us in English, but it's the, where the word, the, the word for the male sperm comes from. It comes right out of the Greek language. Something sown, that is seed, by implication, offspring. So they mean the same, they really mean the same thing. In Hebrew, it's zira. In the Greek, it's sperma. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 55. I guess we've already left there. Just let me read that to you quickly. And uh, then we'll turn it over to Bill to introduce uh, Jonathan. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 55. And he spake as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. So there's the, the descendants. Of Abraham. We'll talk about promises to, to Abraham uh, in two or three weeks. We're also going to talk about those terms in more detail, uh, Satan and uh, devil, when we get to sessions nine and ten. So, so we will see those ideas coming up later on. So in your manual, you'll find these, these other terms. Have a look at them. Um, uh, but, uh, by the way, just, just one point, in your manual, there's a typo there talking about this word cunning. Your manual says that the English word is used four times in the New Testament. It's, uh, um, um, sorry, that's not right. This, this next word, the, the word Eden is used only 20 times in the, it should read Old Testament. The manual says New Testament. Just a little typo there to correct in your manual. Um, our time's up for that. Have a look at your manual, get, a, get an idea of what these different words mean. Uh, they will be helpful to you at some other time. And uh, we'll turn it over to Bill and Jonathan. Thanks, Kip. I know it's uh, there's some terminology there that's kind of important. I think Jonathan's going to end up covering some of it for you, so that's OK. Uh, the unique thing about it is a lot of these terms are found only in the Bible, so it's important to have a good kind of background to them. Uh, we're now going to consider a thematic study, one that kind of considers two different paths that we take by choice. This is one of the threads that takes us right from the beginning of Genesis through to the end of the book of uh, the Bible, to the book of Revelation. Two paths is a discourse between the choices that God has made available to us. We can either believe him and live, or we can nor ignore his message and perish. It's also a discussion about good versus evil in the Bible. So now we're going to turn it over to Jonathan as he explains this in much more detail. Jonathan. And unmute. You need to unmute, Jonathan. Yep, I'm trying. I'm trying. Here we go. I think I got it there. Yeah. No, I need to try and get my PowerPoint back up. And there it is. I think it was already up for you, but it wasn't up for me. So wonderful to uh, to be with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> I, you probably didn't notice last week, but I wasn't actually on last week. Uh, we were on, uh, but we had a, a flood in our basement uh, on at about 6.45 on Tuesday evening. Uh, so as uh, we have a few people who come over um, for, for class, and as they were coming in the door, I was busy grabbing my hip waders and uh, <laughs> dealing with said flood. So it is wonderful to be here this evening. The flood has dissipated, and we are good to go here. Uh, unfortunately, in northern BC, they have put a few more restrictions on us. Um, so we are only allowed five people in our households at the moment. Um, so we have only four people with us this evening. So I don't know if you can notice uh, right here is a nice glowing orb. Um, that is the, the, the projector projecting up on the wall. So those people in front of me who you can't see uh, can see what you are all seeing on your screens. <clears throat> 
Uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Skip, for uh, setting the, the background for basically what we are going to consider now the two paths, right? So we're going to be in um, section or page 29, uh, section 5.3 in your manuals, tons of really, really good information in your manuals, right? So if this is too quick or we're not explaining it enough, you've got that manual that you can always go back through and slowly kind of look through, re-look at those references, uh, make notes as we go through there as well, be like, eh, what, what was that about? Or I, I don't really get that. And maybe take a little bit more time throughout the week uh, to <clears throat> consider uh, something else um, that we may uh, have covered that you didn't quite understand or get. So lots, lots of great information there. So that's where we're going to be. And again, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that's in your manual, uh, but it, it's there for you to kind of go through. We are going to kind of uh, fly through there. So as, as we said here, we're going to look at consider this idea of two paths. And this really starting right here in Genesis, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and, and we're going to look more at, at 3, but then throughout the entire scriptures, this is what is presented to us, two ways. Uh, we have the way we have death and we have life. Uh, we are going to look at light and we're going to look at dark. Uh, we have the idea of flesh and we have the idea of spirit. And these two things are presented to us um, throughout the scriptures. And it's really important when we start to come to read our Bibles, and if we want to read them effectively, having this basis, kind of this general understanding of what the message is, the whole kind of point is, is pretty fundamental, right? And, and again, not only is it fundamental, it's pretty important, right? Death and life, these are things that <laughs> we all care quite a lot about uh, and, and often are really the reason why we come to the Bible, right? Why do we even talk about God? Why do we even discuss religion? Life and death are pretty fundamental reasons um, for that discussion. <clears throat> and that's really what the Bible presents, two options. Uh, and, and there is no kind of a third option or a third way or any other kind of ways. That's all that it presents to us. So you got the reference there on the screen of, of Romans chapter two. We're going to go there and then I'm going to give you another one, just like Skip gave you uh, in, in his. He gives, gives you some extras. So you got to come to the sessions in order to get all the information. You can't just get the manual. You got to come to the sessions to get all the good stuff. So <clears throat> we're going to go to Romans chapter two. Now, you, if you saw it pop up there, hopefully by this point, you're getting a little better at finding your way around in your Bible. Uh, the table of contents there popped up really quickly. If I press backwards, will it bring it back up? There it is. So, but then it's going to disappear on you in just a second. So you got to be quick to find Romans uh, chapter one, sixth book in the New Testament. Uh, so the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we get Acts and then we get Romans. So Romans chapter 2, uh, verses 6 to 11, start to emphasize this idea of two choices, two paths, uh, life and death, light and dark. Romans 2, starting at verse 6. Who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality? Okay, so there's your first choice, eternal life, first option. Verse 8. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works that with, uh, what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God, right? So we can see the two options. We have... Uh, 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 indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish to those who do not obey the truth and who are self-seeking. And we, but we have on the other hand, eternal life to those who by patient continuance do good, right? That's, that's a very simple explanation, a very good options uh, presented to us uh, right there in Romans. Now, the other reference that I'm going to take you to is in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. And so back in, I'll just clarify which version you're using. New King James. New King James. Okay, thank you. 
So back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Yeah, thanks that, Bill. Um, yeah, I, I always use the New King James. I think a lot of the references on here are quoted from the New King James, so I'll, I'll try to, uh, to stick with that one. Again, it's not the, the version that I normally read from. I also read from the King James Version, um, but the New King James Version, two of my children read from it. Um, so it's a, it's a very good alternative. So Deuteronomy chapter 30, fifth book in the Bible, um, back in the law of Moses. Again, this option is presented to the people. Moses presents it. And I think it's very well, very clearly uh, stated for us in Deuteronomy 30 and at verse 19, Moses says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. So that's it's pretty straightforward. And I think it's a pretty uh, easy choice, right? For, for, the most, for the most part, I think if anybody, we were literally presented with that option, I'm going to, here's life. Would you like this option? Would you like this hand? Or do you want this hand? And death, all right? And that's what the Bible presents to us. Uh, and that's what we're going to kind of consider this evening, the, the two options, the two choices um, that are presented to us. And then how do we kind of make that choice? And that's what we've got in the Bible, right? Is how do we distinguish between light and dark, death and life, uh, flesh and spirit, as, as we read through our, our Bibles. <clears throat> so let's go right to Genesis then, right to the beginning and consider this idea of, of light and dark uh, that comes up before we get into Genesis chapter three. So again, right from the beginning, these principles uh, come out uh, and uh, super helpful for us to understand them so that we can work through all of the different sections of our Bible because these things run all the way through. So right in the beginning, Genesis chapter one, two to five, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Okay, so we have a division here. We've got light. God sees the light and it's good. And he divides that from the darkness. Uh, and the darkness, as we continue to read through our Bibles, obviously is associated with not good, with evil or, or with, with bad. <clears throat> uh, right from the beginning, we've got it. Now let's go over almost to the end of our Bibles into 1st John. So 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Jude, and then Revelation. So right at the back of our Bibles. And we can see this, again, this principle that comes up of light and dark and, and the difference between them and then, and then the need, uh, the necessity of knowing the difference and, and, and dividing between them. 1st John chapter 1, verses 5 to 7. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Again, it's very clearly laid out. In God, there's no darkness. God is only light. God is only good. Well, if we want to have fellowship with God, as it's coined there, if we want to have a relationship with God, then we also need to be light. We need to be practicing the light. We need to be in the light. We need to know the light. We need to understand what that light is, as opposed to what darkness is, and, and try and avoid that darkness as much as possible, because God doesn't like darkness. God does not walk in darkness. There is no darkness with God, only light. Okay, so very, very nice to, to outline that. Very black and white. Uh -huh. I have to throw that one in there at some point. Very black and white, right? That's what the scriptures outline for us, the difference, uh, what God is and what God is, is not. Now we're going to go to um, those verses that, that Skip took us to. Uh, the next ones, and again, I think it's so cool as, as we do this, and as we, as we tell you, and as we uh, 
try and teach you that context is so important. Getting all of the different um, parts, right? Reading the verses before and reading the verses after helps you to get a, a great, uh, a much better understanding, get the continuity of what the Bible is actually trying to say. Sometimes, yeah, we, for for time's sake, we're kind of just pulling things out. But hopefully, if you were to read the verses before and the verses after, you get a greater understanding of the context. And that's what we're going to do here. <clears throat> Continuing on this theme of, of light and dark uh, and, and bringing in the Lord Jesus Christ now uh, into this conversation, right? So we're going to go to, to John chapter 3. Um, so Skip took us to verse 14 and 15. This idea of the serpent, this idea of the sacrifice of Christ um, are there. And then we get John 3, 16, right? As Skip said, and as I agree with, probably the most well-known verse in the Bible John 3.16, many of us can probably quote it. I don't know if there's any people in the back row who are interested in quoting John 3.16 for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but receive everlasting life. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but uh, she did a, quite a, a good job of quoting John 3.16 for you, right? So, um, <clears throat> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, two paths, right? Believe in Jesus, eternal life. Don't believe in Jesus, not eternal life. And that's really what we get uh, as, we, as we keep going in John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. <clears throat> He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Two choices, believe or not believe. Two choices, life or death. Two paths that are offered to us. But now we get this idea of light and dark that is also brought in here when we keep going in verses uh, 18 down to 21. We put them there and we've highlighted these little sections on the screen. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he is, that's verse, I've already read, pardon me, that's verse 18, We're verse 19 now, sorry, jump to 19, and this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. Okay, so again, just emphasizing this thing. This is not a, a one-off thing. This is a, uh, a theme that runs right through the scriptures. We have two paths. Light and dark is a good way to describe it. And it's very easy for us to understand this, um, very, very, very easy for us to grasp it, even more so in our society when we have lights that we get to flick on and off all the time. It's very easy to demonstrate, well, it's dark now, well, now it's light. And that's what we get when we come to our, our Bibles, when we come to the scriptures, when we read them effectively, we understand what light is. And we get to understand what darkness is at the opposite side, and then we get to choose between life and death. We get to choose if we believe or if we don't believe. And, uh, and we have the consequences or the rewards according to, to that choice. So now let's go back, right back to Genesis and start to work our way through Genesis chapter three. I think I get to about quarter past, 10 past. Yeah, about there. Now this- how about 25 times? No. <laughs> um, the, this is, this is, um, it is not possible to cover this in, in, in this 15 minutes. Um, this is uh, class after class. I still work my way through this, and this is still massive themes throughout the scriptures. This is a never ending study um, that we get in Genesis 3, and then the implications of that that run all the way through and all of the different. Uh, 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 lines of the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, the light and the dark that run, that run all the way through there. So we're not going to do it justice. I'm hoping that we do another seminar based on Genesis um, after this one, uh, that again, we can, well, we can slow down a little bit and we'll, we'll work our way through specifically all of these things because 
if you don't get Genesis, you don't get the Bible. You, you've got it. Again, you start at the beginning, right? That's, that's pretty a no-brainer there. You get that, and then everything else will kind of build off of that. So let's go back, Genesis chapter 3, and start to take a look at these principles of light and dark, life and death, um, that come up for us in Genesis, uh, and some of the other principles that we will see. So Skip started to talk to us uh, a little bit about the serpent, and that's what we get here in Genesis chapter 3 and at verse 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning in my version. What do you have, Sharon? Do you have cunning? Crafty. Crafty. All right. The, new, uh, the King James Version is subtle. Do you have a different one over there, Lois? Yeah. No, you don't have subtle. one. You got subtle over there, too. Crafty, cunning, subtle. Uh, then any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, God, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of life. Okay, so right away we have this serpent. He's described as cunning, but he's also described, or it is described as a beast of the field. It's described as a living creature that, and that God had made. So God had made this serpent. God had made a snake, um, but it had a, a slightly more... Uh, more of an intellect, a little bit more of the capacity for reasoning to a, a certain extent, because it's more subtle than the other animals. Um, but still, God had made it. And this serpent um, provides a, a, a question um, for the woman to consider. Uh, now, just taking a look at um, this idea of the animal mind versus the human mind. So the serpent is described as a beast of the field. So it's an animal, right? God created it. It's described as a beast of the field. You can go back into Genesis 1 and 2 and look at the other beasts of the field that God describes. You can go forward in uh, chapters uh, 6, uh, 7, and 8, when God kills many beasts of the field in the flood um, when they are wiped off. But that's all that the serpent is described as. It's just described as an animal but it's got a, a certain amount of, of, of reasoning. Now, animals really have two things that they've got. They've got survival intellect, survival instincts, and then they've got a certain amount of, of, of reasoning. Whereas us, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, made in the likeness and the image of God, have a moral conscience. We get to decide what is actually right and what is actually wrong with morals. Um, and, and hopefully, eventually, we get to, to decide what is right and wrong based on, on God's principles and on, on the Bible. And we get to make the decisions between life and death, right and wrong, light and dark. But animals don't have the moral conscience. They have a certain capacity to, to reason and to, and to look at things and, and kind of uh, do stuff. But it's based on basically just survival instincts. That's all that animals have. Where us, because we are created, and you have it there, Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27, we have the moral capacity to reason between what is right and wrong. And animals do not have that moral capacity. And this is what we have there here that the, that the serpent speaks. He just says, well, hey, here's some, here's some fruit on the tree. Uh, what do you think? Do you think this is, should we eat this thing? It looks pretty good. Um, and then we get the idea uh, that, that Eve starts to work through in, in, in her mind, right? So he presents this uh, idea to, to, to the woman um, and, and says, hey, shall we not eat? Shall you not eat of every tree of the garden? Just as a question. Well, she responds. Uh, and she responds with what, what they've been told. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. All right, so she presents the truth. She presents light. This is what God had told them. They, she, they were told, she was told, do not eat of the tree of, uh, of good and evil. Well, here we then go. This then is the first lie. And as all lies go, there is a element of truth in it. And it's so important that we really consider what is true, because what is not true is often sounds really good and sounds right. So the serpent presents the question. Eve gives her response, the correct response, which says, no, we are not supposed to eat of the tree. 
And then the serpent says, well, no, that's not actually true. Verse four, the serpent saith to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so we have a blatant lie. And then we have some actual kind of truths that actually are there. So the idea that when he says you shall not surely die is that's completely false, right? If you turn back Genesis chapter two and at verse 17, it reads, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so that is completely incorrect. Now, did the serpent eat of the, of the, of the fruit? Maybe he did. Maybe they, they, he's not commanded that he's not supposed to. He's just a beast of the field. Uh, maybe he ate of it. And he's like, well, I didn't die. So why would you die, right? So maybe, maybe that's where this, this kind of response comes from as, as a beast who just works off of instinct. Whatever the case may be, that is blatantly not true. Uh, and, and Eve should have picked up on that. But he sugarcoats it with a little bit of, of, of the truth that he's got in there. Your eyes will be opened. You'll be as gods or be like God, knowing good and evil. Oh, yeah, this is, this is going to be a good thing. You're not going to die. And not only that, but you get these wonderful things that are going to come along with eating it. And this gets Eve's thinking. This is where the moral capacity, the moral reasoning of humans takes over. And this is where the decisions need to be made. And this is the process that Eve goes through. Verse six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she, uh, she also gave to her husband with her and he did eat. Okay, so she now starts, the, the, the wheels start turning. She starts to listen um, and she doesn't remember the specific commandment that she was given. Okay, she uh, forgets about the first part, you shall not die, or the commandment that you are going to die if you eat this, and only dwells on the good parts. And isn't that just the way we are? We often forget about all of the negative things and only pick out the good thing. If I do this, oh, it's going to be really good, but I forget that all of these other negative consequences are also going to come if I decide to do those things. If I need to get to work a little quicker than I think I should be, and I go a little bit quicker than I should, then there are could be consequences. And sometimes I forget about those other negative consequences and maybe drive a little bit too fast. But there's all of those things, right, in our lives that we often just focus on the, the thing we want to focus on and forget about all of the negative consequences that can come from our decisions. <clears throat> I want you to store in the back of your brains Take a little note of good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. Okay, so those three things, just tuck that away. Hopefully we'll get to it. I don't know if we'll get to it or not, but if we don't, there's an option for you to take a look at that and consider where does that come up again in the scriptures or where can we get a Bible echo to those three kind of things good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desire to make one wise. Uh, hopefully we'll get to it, but we'll see how it goes. So she takes of the tree, she sins, and then we go from there. Then all of the consequences and all of the repercussions um, start to go. So she chose, there was two options. There was either listen to God, there was the one path that, she, that, that was presented to her, and now she's presented with another option, and she chooses that option. And this is the rest of the Bible. The rest of the Bible is all about that choice. And in the end, ultimately, Genesis kicks us out of the garden. Revelation brings us back to the garden. And, and that's the whole kind of point of the scriptures is really trying to get back to, to this place where we were before Genesis chapter three. Uh, that's the whole point. We want to get back to Genesis two, right? That's where I want to be, Genesis two. Uh, and the rest of the scriptures is, is all about that choice and all about the repercussions from that. So from there, uh, the, the, the man and the woman are um, are removed, or, or the consequences start. So the first thing is that they, they are shamed. 
Um, they, they feel shame. Verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked and they try and do something about it. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Okay, so they try and solve the issue that they uh, are presented with. They, they kind of, their eyes are open, which is again what the serpent says, you will know good and evil. Oh, now we know good and evil. And now we understand that, whoops, that wasn't what we were supposed to do. That was in direct disobedience to the commandments of God. God then comes to them um, in verses eight uh, and nine and, and communicates with them. Uh, again, all sorts of principles here that we don't have time to, to look at. Verse nine, just if we think about that, just think about it. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said unto him, where are you? Do you think God didn't know where Adam and Eve were? That, right? So again, why does God actually say that? Why is that question presented to Adam and Eve? Hmm, something for you to think about. Uh, maybe you can send me an email and, and give me your thoughts or ideas as to why God actually um, asks, asks them, where are you? Right? Adam responds, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And then again, a question that God asks them. Why does God ask them this? Do you think God doesn't know? He said, uh, uh, verse 11, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Do you think God didn't know that they hadn't eaten of the tree, right? So why are we asked these questions? Why does God ask these questions? Then in verse 11, there's two ways to look at this. It's either a lack of uh, accountability that Adam just blames his wife, or maybe it's a fact that Adam is confessing uh, and that he's owning up for what he did. Uh, regardless, um, we have um, this little interaction. Adam says, hey, I ate of the tree um, that, uh, that the woman gave me. God turns to the woman and says, hey, what have you done? The woman said, ah, the serpent uh, deceived me and I ate. And then you would think if the serpent was anything more than just a beast of the field, that God would ask the same questions of the serpent. But God, knowing the serpent is just a beast of the field, does not have the moral reasoning or capacity to understand these questions, just tells him what's up, right? Because you have done this cursed her more than all cattle, again, more than all cattle, it describes him as, a, as an animal, uh, more than every beast of the field, twofold emphasis on that, on your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And then we get to verse 15. Maybe I tried to go to verse 15. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and this is a fundamental um, principle with this idea of two paths. We get this seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent presented to us here in verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we have enmity. We have the seed of the woman and we have the seed of the serpent and we have the woman and we have um, the serpent that are all presented um, to us here. Good, that shows up slightly different than what I've got on my screen. I thought I had all these people on my screen that you couldn't see, but uh, you don't see that, so that's good. Sorry, pardon me for that. Um, sometimes I just think out loud and you get to hear a little bit of what's going on in my head. So there you go. Um, so we've got this. <laughs> um, this principle of the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that, that comes up. Uh, and, and the serpent, in the end, ultimately, basically stands for darkness, uh, stands for the flesh, stands for, for, uh, the, for evil. Uh, and on the other hand, we have the seed of the, ser uh, seed of the woman that stands for the light and stands for good and stands for life. Um, we can see this idea that uh, uh, serpents are described or, or, or um, snakes are described as, as, as bad things um, in, in Matthew chapter three, not necessarily, but often, often they are as, as Skip went through there. Jesus called the wicked Pharisees and Sadducees a brood of vipers or a generation of serpents. Right? So this idea of anything that stands in opposition to God um, is described as the seed of the serpent. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to look at that a little bit more um, as we go here. And we're going to see these two lines. We're going to see a righteous line, a, a good line described as the seed of the woman. And we have the, uh, the wicked or the bad line uh, described as the seed of the serpent. 
Okay, so from there we get the curses that come upon the, the world. Okay, in verse 14, you have the curse that is put on the, the serpent, um, crawl on its belly, uh, eat dust. Uh, we have the curse that's put on the woman, um, child pain in childbirth, uh, multiplication of seed, and subjection to her husband. Uh, then we have the curse to the, uh, to the man. Uh, and again, if you talk to any farmers, this is incredibly apparent. Um, the curse that they would bring forth thorns and thistles from the sweat of your brow that you would have to eat bread until those famous words for uh, until you return to the ground for out of it were you taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return. Again, Bible echo back into Genesis uh, 1 and 2 where God creates man out of the dust of the ground. So we were dust and eventually we're just going to go back to the dust. Um, so that is the consequence of the choice that was made. The choice was, do you want life or do you want death? And unfortunately, Eve chose death. Uh, and, and those consequences now are passed on to all of uh, humankind. But that's not the end. Phew! Fortunately, that's not it, because we have a hope that is also presented here to us. It was presented in verse 15, if you read it really closely, he, being the seed of the woman, is going to bruise your head, okay? And this idea of bruising a head is more than just a simple ouchies on the head. It's more of a crushing blow to the head. And if you stomp on the head of a snake, the snake doesn't survive, okay? There's no more snake. All right, so that's, yay, that's a good thing, right? And so we can see that written in there that the seed of the woman is eventually going to crush the head of the serpent. But on the other hand, you, the seed of the serpent, the serpent, there is going to be a, a minor discomfort, a bruise on the heel. Yeah, that's a pain. It's not a, get that one as well. I got that, yeah, I threw that one in there. No, I didn't mean to. Uh, it's gonna be a pain in the heel for a little bit of time, but ultimately you get over a pain in the heel. Generally, you don't get over a bruised head, a, a crushed head. So there is a promise in, the, in that part as well that we've got. Well, that's not the only um, promise that God uh, provides, right? He continues on uh, and helps, uh, helps out. They, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve, tried to create their own coverings, create their own uh, uh, solution to the problem with the sown fig leaves. Well, God says, yeah, it's not quite good enough. Verse 20 and 21, and Adam called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all living. Again, I think that's actually a reference back that Eve, out of Eve would come life, right? Eventually the seed of the woman would have life and we would get life um, back. And then in verse 21, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothe them. Okay, so God will always provide, even though we run into some pretty serious challenges and difficulties. Uh, sometimes we mess up. Ultimately, God will be there to provide that covering and look after us. And that's what he does. He provides the sacrifice. Ultimately, life, uh, eternal life, granting eternal life, uh, redemption, uh, covering of sins, forgiveness of sins requires sacrifice, requires the shedding of blood. In order to get uh, a skin from an animal, it needs to be removed from the animal, and that's generally fatal. Um, so there needs to be sacrifice, the shedding of blood, uh, in order for the skins to be uh, recovered. Kind of goes along with what Skip was saying. Why did Jesus need to be crucified? Well, why did he, what was the point of that, right? Forgiveness of skins skins, sins, requires sacrifice, uh, requires the shedding of blood um, for, for, for forgiveness of sins. And this is what we get here right back in Genesis. God lays that out. Not going to go to no Hebrews 9 verses 22 or Numbers chapter 17. Uh, again, on your time, look those references up, take a look at them. Just two of many, many references that, that talks about that principle. And then again, I think we even get an even cooler reference to this idea of the way, of the path, of the choice that we've got and how God is keeping it open and presented to us so that we can actually get back 
to Genesis chapter 2 before Genesis chapter 3, okay? So really neat in, in verse 24, right at the end of Genesis 3. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. All right, so it's not, it's, it's to guard the way. It's to make sure that there is still a way that is open, that we can get to the tree of life. Uh, it's not necessarily just to stop everybody from getting to it, but it's to make sure that it's guarded, that there is a path, that there is a choice that we can make, uh, and then we can take that path. But there is, there's only one way, right? And, and it's guarded and it's protected. Um, and, it's, uh, and, and God has left it open for us to try and, and, and find and make the decision to make it. All right, so this is kind of summarizing what we've said. We've got the, the, the two ways, the two choices that are presented to us. We've got the way of darkness, the way of flesh, human nature, seed of the serpent. That's on one hand. On the other hand, we have the way of light, we have the way of truth, we have the way of the spirit, and we have the seed of the woman. Now that basically takes us through the rest of scriptures. We're just going to see all through the Bible, all of the different people, all of the different stories are all just fleshing out. Huh, maybe that was kind of a pun as well there. All sorts of good ones coming out tonight. Um, that's just going to show us these different ways, different scenarios, different situations, different ways that it works itself out. Is this darkness? Is this life? Is this flesh? Is this spirit? Is this truth? Is this the seed of the woman or is this the seed of the serpent? All the way through. The first one that we've got is Cain and Abel right there in the next chapter. Again, this is what are we going to choose? What are you going to are you going to do your own thing? Cain said, nah, I'm going to do it my way, and I'm not going to accept what God asked me to do. And Abel's like, okay, I'll present a sacrifice, just like what you showed us that we were supposed to do. Two ways, two ways to do things, my way or God's way. Cain symbolizes for us and, and becomes that symbol of my way, flesh, serpent, and Abel comes to represent spirit and truth and light and the seed of the woman all the way through the scriptures. Those two are, are laid out again for that. And again, God presents us. Oh, okay, here we go. I presented you with two options in Genesis 3. Now I'm going to give you a, a demonstration, a, uh, an example of how this actually works its way out in Cain and Abel. And again, these all sorts of different examples all the way through. Um, yeah, now I ran out of time. Uh, so hopefully uh, we can discuss this in more detail uh, as, as we go along, uh, especially if we, can, if we can do another seminar based on Genesis, you've got all of this information in your manual uh, that you can go through and all of this other stuff that I was supposed to cover. And Skip did tell me that I was not going to get done and I didn't believe him, but I should have because sometimes I talk too much. Um, but we've got all sorts of other things. This was the reference that you were supposed to think about when we thought about uh, it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and desire to make one wise. When we go over to 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, that's your homework for tonight. Actually, it's your homework for the week because I won't check your homework tomorrow. Uh, but next week, all right, take a look at 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, and I want you to see the connections that you've got there between Genesis and then 1 John. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. <clears throat> we keep going through. We got Noah. Again, the two ways, two options, two choices. What are we going to choose? Listen to God or do our own thing? We get into Abraham. Same kind of thing. He's called out of the world uh, and he's called into the promised land and he has to make a separation and he separates himself. He leaves his homeland, travels north and eventually comes down into the land of Canaan. He separates himself. He chooses to um, follow in the way of God. Uh, yeah, we get all sorts of things on Abraham. Again, hopefully we can do Genesis because Abraham is fundamental to uh, understanding the Bible uh, and, and reading our Bibles. Uh, this is a really interesting graphic that we've got here. This lays out for us, and this was that Skip actually referred to, the seed of the woman. Right, that lines us up, hopefully, 
I don't know if you can see that. No, it doesn't show up on there. I'm, it's right here on my screen. I'm, I'm circling us right there. And I'm even pointing to it on the screen over here. Us. Uh, right there. We can be a part of the seed of the woman, hopefully, and not of the seed of the serpent like Cain, Ham, Ishmael, for examples, are there. <clears throat> um, uh, this, the promised seed that we had in, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, we had that seed that was told that would crush the, uh, the head of the serpent. That seed is also promised to Abraham that he would inherit the land. It's also promised to David and then also to Mary, that, that Mary's son would be that promised seed, and he would be the one that would redeem us uh, and that would save us and that would crush the serpent's head. And finally, let's finish up with this reference because this brings it down to us. This brings it right into my lap, into my life, into my decisions that I get to make. Which path am I going to choose? And what are the either the consequences or the incredible benefits that we can uh, enjoy when we try and make the, the good choice and the right choice? Genesis chapter, or not Genesis, Galatians, um, Galatians 3, 26 to 29. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we didn't have time to look at that promise. But through faith, we can be the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. We can be in Christ and we can be inheritors. We can inherit the promises that were made to Abraham. Those promises to Abraham are a continuation of the promise that was made to Eve and the serpent in the garden, that we can be in Christ, that we can be uh, forgiven for our sins, and that we can inherit eternal life. So there's the two choices. We got life and we've got death. And we read our Bibles effectively so that we can understand how we make those choices. What should we do in different situations? What should we believe? What should we not believe? How can we distinguish between light and dark? Skip is going to give us some tips on how we can better read our Bible um, and help us to, to make those good and right decisions. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. I don't know if you were going to say anything, Bill, but uh, we'll go right into this. Jonathan, I probably confused you a little bit in there when I sent you that little chat saying, go to chap go to 8.25. I didn't mean chapter 8, verse 25. I meant, take a few more minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> I get it. I was, like, I was like, Genesis 8, that's like, <laughs> why? I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't quite, I think, okay. Sorry about that. I, I should have put PM after that. Oh, All right, uh, another tip. Another tip for us when, when we're doing our Bible study and our Bible reading, always start with prayer. You would have noticed when, uh, when every time that we started these seminars, Bill has always opened the seminars with a prayer. He has always closed the seminars with a prayer. What we're doing when we do that is we are offering thanks to God for his grace, for his is the benefit that he gives to you and me uh, to, to, uh, that he gives to you and me by preserving his word, by, by giving the Bible so that you and I have a record of his plan and purpose for this earth, so that you and I can understand that God did create the earth so that it can be inhabited by people who develop his character and reflect his name, as we talked about last week. Uh, God has done that, and he has provided his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the means whereby we can get to that kingdom. So thanks to God that he has given us that opportunity. And as we sit down to read our Bibles, sometimes we find it hard to understand. So the other reason for prayer, particularly when we are first learning what the Bible is about, is to make requests for guidance and help to understand uh, what the Bible is all about 
and to be able to apply the principles that the Bible is talking about. So offer thanks, start with a prayer, offering thanks to God for his many blessings to us, particularly when we're looking at learn to read the Bible effectively, or preserving his word for us, and make requests for guidance and help to understand and apply the principles of the, the things that are written in the Bible. And God does answer prayer. If we are, our thinking is in line with God. If we are the seed of the woman, not the seed of the serpent. If our thinking is aligned with God's will, then God will answer prayer. He does answer prayer. Sometimes we don't recognize the answers because sometimes we say to God, please do this for me. And God says, no, 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 that's not good for you. And so he doesn't do it for us, so we think he hasn't answered our prayer. Our, our thinking needs to be aligned with God's. And when it is, God answers prayer. Let's have a look at these passages. Now, the, uh, the Acts and James passages are in your manual. Have a look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. That one is not in your manual. Uh, that one would be helpful to add into your manual. Just make a note of it. So Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. Now, chapter 7 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the, the Jesus' uh, first, one of his first teachings, or in, in Matthew's record anyway. Uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you've got the gospel in a nutshell. All the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ brought into a nutshell. And notice what he says in chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man of, uh, is there of you who, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him uh, an opus, a serpent? And we are back to our word from earlier this evening. And verse 11, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? So we're descendants of Adam and Eve. We have this natural tendency to do evil. So he says, if you, verse 11, being evil, know how to give good gifts, then how about God, who is the perfect example of all that is good? If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, what do you think God would do? If it's something that we need, if we ask God to help him, to help us in our understanding of the Bible, as we read the Bible, God will help us. Let's go over to Acts. So you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels, and then the book of Acts, chapter 10, and this whole chapter is about uh, Cornelius. He is a Roman centurion. Uh, he believed in God, but he believed the way the Jews did. Uh, he didn't realize that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. So he needed to learn this. And so God sends an angel to him and tells him, go to Peter, and Peter will tell you what you ought to do. Verse 10, notice that Cornelius has been praying. Uh, chapter 10, I should say, and verse 30, where I'm mixing my words again. Acts chapter 10, verse 30 through to 33. Uh, which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea. Sorry, that's chapter 9. Chapter 10 and verse 30. Cornelius said, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. So he's worshiping God. He's fasting. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, 
A man stood before me in bright, in bright clothing, so an angel comes to him and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore, so here's the answer. There's something for you to do, Cornelius. This is an answer to your prayer. Send therefore to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter, who's lodged in the house of Simon of Canna by the seaside, who, when he comes, shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded to thee of God. And if we were to read through the rest of the chapter, we'd find that, that uh, Peter talks to Cornelius and all that are in his house about the Lord Jesus Christ and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. One more passage, one more book that we'll have a look at, and that's James chapter 1, verse 5. So this is about seven books back from Revelation, but those are really small books. So if you go to Revelation and just go back a little ways, you'll find yourself in James. James chapter 1. And here I am going the wrong way. James chapter 1 and verse 5. There's the one <coughs> verse by itself. Other verses here would be helpful, but let's just let's take the one verse. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, if we don't understand what the Bible is about, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. God does answer prayer. He will answer our prayers. Go over to chapter 5, James chapter 5, and verses 13 to 18. Now he's talking about prayer and a whole bunch of different things that prayer can do for us. It doesn't just help us in understanding his word, but it can help us with other things as well. So verses 13 to 18, of James chapter 5. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church or the elders of the ecclesia and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, prayer of belief, someone who believes what they, they are praying for. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another. Don't just be selfish in your prayers and just pray for me, but pray for others as well. Um, verse 16, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. God does answer prayer, not if we're asking for a fancy car, but if we're asking for things which are aligned with God's plan and purpose for the earth, God will answer those prayers. So that's another tip. Start and end with prayer. Go. Thank you, Skip. Thank you, Jonathan. The concept of the two paths really is, um, Jonathan didn't really get to the end of what he wanted to say. But if you go to Galatians chapter 5, it says this. Walk in the spirit, in verse 16, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So you're getting this divide here as Jonathan uh, went through. The, the difference between walking with God and, and those who oppose God, it goes on to talk about in this same chapter in Galatians 5, verse 19. It says, now the works of the flesh are these. And then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the spirit is, and he gives these contrasting uh, views of what is good and what is evil. We understand what evil is. 
You don't even need to read the scriptures to know that. We also know what doing good involves. We also don't need to read a scripture to do that. But if we want to know what God really wants from us, that's really where we have to pay attention and be aware of these two choices, these two paths that uh, will help us in our understanding. So thanks for joining us tonight. We hope you found this series uh, so far helpful. And especially tonight, there's so much we've gone through. Uh, please join me now as we offer a word of thanks to the Lord. Almighty God, our Father, we are thankful for what you have provided for us in your word. As we have considered this night, the temptation of Adam and Eve and the failure to uphold your law, and they followed the way of the serpent, which was to fulfill the flesh. They were looking for something that gave them advantage at that time, and they ignored your word at their peril. The sentence of death, therefore, is passed on all mankind. And now we wait for the redemption that is offered through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you provided. The seed that would, yes, be bruised for a short period of time and die and go to the grave, but he would rise again and stand in your presence and become the means of salvation for each one of us. We thank you for this message that we have before us tonight. We pray that the things that we have heard, we will think about throughout the coming week, that we may meditate upon these things and apply them in the way we live day by day. Please hear us as we pray, for we ask all things in Jesus' name. Amen.